It's This Week in Creationism, episode number 52. I'm your host, Joel Duff, and here we take a look at the goings-on in the world of young earth creationism. First up, we're going to talk about what happened to creation conferences. Let's just take a look at uh, how many uh, events are different young earth creationist ministries putting on today, and I want to compare that to the past. What's happened? Has the pandemic made uh, a big difference in how young earth creationists are meeting their audience and where they're meeting their audience? We got, we got to talk about this heat problem not being solved. So I'll explain what the heat problem is and how Answers in Genesis has published a big paper that uh, doesn't solve the problem. And it's fascinating the language they use as they try to explain that it's a problem still for young earth creationism. And then there's Grand Canyon origins, post-flood, end of the flood, debates among young earth creationists about this. We've got all of these and some more items coming up next. Yeah, let's start here this week. I've been following Young Earth Creationism for a solid 25 years. I've been to many creation conferences. I've heard Ken Ham and many other Young Earth Creationists uh, speak from both Creation Ministries International, Answers in Genesis, and Institute for Creation Research, the three big Christian uh, creation science apologetics ministries. And I've observed over the past, especially just the past couple years, a dramatic drop-off in the numbers of different creation conferences and events that these organizations put on. Uh, except for, well, with one notable exception, but we'll get to that. But the big one, the big thing I've noticed is Answers in Genesis has really withdrawn from the going out, sending out speakers to local churches and having them talk about creation science. And we might ask ourselves, is this because there is less demand for the message? Are churches not asking for creation speakers to come to their churches and give them presentations? Or is it a conscious decision on the behalf of some young earth creationist ministries to change their way of approaching and doing their apologetics? In the case of Answers in Genesis, that answer might include something like a conscious decision to withdraw resources from sending people out and rather drawing people in, right? They have a lot of other types of outreach. They've got their TV station. They have their uh, private network you can subscribe to to get other uh, Answers in Genesis videos. Of course, you can get a lot of that through YouTube as well. Um, they have Answers News, a daily, or not daily, a twice weekly um, show that they put on Facebook and YouTube. And then, of course, they have uh, an enormous amount of literature and other videos you can buy so they can do streaming you know, to your church rather than an actual person come there. And maybe most importantly, they put on conferences still, but they're, at, they're housed in their own institution, right? Come to us right send the world to us we don't come to them anymore in the sense of physically coming to you but you can virtually come to us or you can physically come to us through the ark encounter and the creation museum all right and we have pastors conference women's conference conferences for just about any type of audience uh, or type of group that would like to be ministered at our particular institution and so it's very clear that the number of speakers that Answers in Genesis employs has gone way down. They've very much dramatically reduced that. Now, initially, I thought maybe this was because of the pandemic, all right? The initiation of the pandemic in early 2020, obviously, there weren't speakers going out at that time, and this was a great time to sort of retool the ministry and say, hey, we're not going to, this is a, our, we were already, hmm, we're going to change and shift our focus. But in going back, I've realized that this was already well underway for Answers in Genesis. They were already reducing the number of outreach events in terms of going out to different places. They're really restricting themselves, especially Ken Ham, um, who, who is busy because he's in high demand, uh, to only like the biggest events, right? You had to have a huge conference uh, in which there might be multiple day conference and thousands of people of attending versus you know, individual churches, maybe for a Friday evening or a Saturday morning thing, or maybe a Sunday morning, a Sunday school uh, lesson or something like that. 
So this was already happening before the pandemic, and the pandemic sort of just sped the whole process up in terms of eliminating, probably gave them excuse for essentially laying off some of their, their speakers bureau. And now they're just down to a couple uh, people. You can see in this picture right here, host an event. You got Ken Ham. This is Terry Mortensen on the left side. Um, he's been around for a long time, uh, although he's really basically retired and just does a couple events. Uh, Brian Osborne, who's one of their favorite speakers. And then you have Georgia Purdoms, who's been with Answers in Genesis for a very long period of time as well. But she spends most of her time in various outreach endeavors, but mostly at the Ark Encounter now. And then, of course, uh, Bodie Hoge here, who's uh, Ken Ham's, uh, it's Bodie Hoge right here, Ken Ham's son-in-law, uh, who is also in charge of a lot of operations at uh, Answers in Genesis. And so this is really the core group now that represents their, their main speakers. Now, they have other employees that will draw in for, for speaking, and they have a bunch of other people who do talks at Answers in Genesis and, or, or the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. Uh, up here, you can see some of their big events coming, right? They're going to Australia. Uh, they have a bunch of different... Most of these events are actually at the Ark Encounter. But when I looked, I could only find four events scheduled for the next four months that are sort of like the typical what they've been doing for 25 years or 20 years in case of answers in genesis going out to individual churches uh, who are hosting them for a age of the earth uh you know topic or creation evolution topic or something like that now let's contrast that with icr right institute for creation research they've always been into going out to local churches and having them be hosted for various uh, talks. And they're still doing that much more now, much more than Answers in Genesis is. In other words, they're a little more grassroots in terms of meeting people where they're at. But even they have either lost opportunities to do this, in other words, have they fallen out of favor? Are they not being asked as frequently? Uh, or do they, are they monetarily uh, strapped for the ability to actually go out to these places? Now, many churches are actually helping to pay uh, for these events, so that might not be the case. But, you know, they have maybe 25 different events over the next couple months. Now, Creation Ministries International, which is, which is uh, housed in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, they have by far the most events and the most speakers. So when I look through their schedule, they have in excess of 40 some talks all over the country. And most of these are at local churches. Uh, one time talks, maybe there's an, there's a, you can see like there's three events in St. Louis or two events in St. Louis, three in Indianapolis. That's probably a case where there are three local churches that have teamed up to, you know, we have a speaker coming. Hey, would you like to have, oh, we'll have somebody here Friday, somebody else Saturday, or maybe two things on Saturday, another church on Sunday morning. And so they spread the wealth in terms of the, the individual speakers. Here's a picture of Rob Carter right there. Rob Carter is somewhere almost every, I would say every two weeks, he is giving a talk uh, somewhere. And so people at churches are having opportunities to actually interact with these creation scientists as opposed to Answers in Genesis, which has always been a little, even when they come to a church, they're not terribly social in terms of, they're kind of like big speakers, right? They come, they have handlers, you know, so they don't get, you know, they don't really get uh, direct questions very often. They're usually like passed through some process and so filtered out. And typically, I've been to a lot of these conferences. What happens is um, they take some questions, but somebody's decided which questions to ask. And then usually the answers are, we've got a stack of books back there that you can buy that have the answers for you, right? The answers books. Um, whereas Creation Ministries International takes a much more hands-on approach, a much more personal approach uh, with individuals and is willing to talk to them and, and sort of sit around and gab afterwards. And so that's given them sort of an, that's, I guess, their niche, I guess you could say, in terms of spreading young earth creationism. Uh, but what's my overall impression? My overall impression is there are fewer events that might be due to um, budgetary restrictions. But here's what I think it's mostly due to. Right? Many factors, but I think one of the largest factors is a reduced interest. It's just a reduced interest in this topic. The topic of young earth creation or is the world young 
creation versus evolution. This was, I think, from, I'll say 2000 to 2015, but I think uh, 2000, 2010 might be the heyday, uh, was just a hot topic in a lot of churches. This was a question that was being asked all the time. And it was there was articles being written in church newsletters. There was lots of internet debate in the early days of the internet. Uh, this is something that people would have been talking about a lot. And so they're going to be asking questions of their pastors and their pastors are like, oh, what am I what am I supposed to say? Let's get a creation speaker in here. And we knew we could have a big draw. Right. Because if we bring this speaker in, this will be something that they use as an outreach program. Right. Hey, we're going to we're going to have somebody coming talking about this topic, this famous scientist. Right. And they'll answer all your science questions. And that is like draws people in right and of course they thought also this will draw in non-christians and others that are curious and that'll introduce them to our church and so forth so they see this as a as an outreach as a an apologetic ministry of individual local church which are being helped by these apologetic ministries right so great that uh flourished right plenty of Plenty of places, plenty of churches scrambling to try to find young earth creationist speakers. I could easily find within a hundred mile radius at any time like, oh, I could go over here, you know, next weekend or I could drive down there and I could go to a creation conference there. There was all kinds of ones around in Ohio. I would almost always, if I wanted to attend one, I could find one I could go to. I haven't been able to find two things to go to within a 200 mile radius really in the past year. Uh, and even before the pandemic, it was already getting to be slim pickings. And as I said before, I think this is partially due to a reduced interest in, the, in this overall topic. So I have some, I don't have rigorous uh, data to, to prove this, uh, but I have a lot of uh, pieces of information that, that push me in that particular direction. One is, I'll tell you that uh, my own blog, now I know people don't read as much, That's a, that, so there's a confounding variable here. Uh, people read less and less and less, blogs become less uh, popular over time. But my blog traffic has waned about 50% over the last five years. Um, that traffic, despite my having written more and more and more several years ago, now I'm not writing as much. And despite having added new material, I was getting less traffic all the time. Just less interest overall in the topic combined with fewer people reading. And so that was bad for the blog. But then I started asking others who do similar things, and they've also noticed that same trend. And now, especially in the last five years, and especially since the pandemic, there's a whole other host of issues within the church which have taken precedent, all right? Gender questions, um, well, CRT, and you know, all these catchphrases, right? Things that people are talking about now that are being pushed from various different angles. And this is what's now, if you want to have a conference, right? Well, let's see, we're going to have our annual conference. What, what are we going to talk about? Some kind of social justice issue, uh, some other type of thing like, well, well what about uh, the, the, the existence of hell? Or there's, there's several other questions that have sort of become kind of hot topics over the last five years. What's not a hot topic? What's the age of the earth? And I'll attribute that also partly due to, you know, partly lack of interest. It's sort of off to the side now because there's other hot issues. But I'll also say, I think it's also a fairly a partially resolved issue within the church. From 2005 to 2015, there was an absolute deluge of books, magazine articles, all kinds of stuff written within church circles, within church magazines, on the topic of the age of the earth and on the topic of biological evolution. Right? You could, anyone who had questions in that area could satisfy their, their interest because they had innumerable things to look at many things being worked through, many different books out there. Uh, and as a result, it's not, in, it's not an area of curiosity. It's not like, uh, it's not the area of curiosity that it once was, as if there's like these unplumbed depths in which, uh, okay, a bunch of people haven't talked about this before and I, I wanna hear what the latest thinking is. 
nope, uh, you can get a book. You can just read a, you can watch a YouTube video, right? You can watch my YouTube videos. You can you watch, read my blog posts and so forth. It's all out there for the person that's curious. And so all of these factors, I think, have combined to sort of reduce the overall interest in this topic. Now, I don't want to pretend like young earth creationists is going away, and creation is going away. But we all know that th th there is a diminished overall interest in it when you, uh, the Barna survey and uh, the Gallup surveys and other things that uh, ask questions about the age of the earth and uh, man's uh, relationship to animals and sort of those, those questions about evolution. We see that there is a shift, right, in the U.S. population in terms of their attitudes about creation and evolution. Uh, but there's still a significant number of people under the influence of young earth creationism, a significant number of churches who claim to be young earth creationist churches. But even those aren't really playing that interest up as high. I think all this is putting a lot of pressure on Ken Ham and others who, whose really livelihood depends on the interest level of this. Now, that's why I think Ken Ham's actually smart in terms of what he's been doing with Answers in Genesis, which is essentially turning them away from the science all right, scientific creation or creation science and turning them into a social issue, all encompassing, you know, answers for Christians on all different topics. Right. I think he's read the tea leaves that, hey, we, you know, we've kind of come up with the answers. Uh, they don't have the answers. They're bad answers, but they're the best answers they can come up with. You know, I mean, they've they've had 25 years to try to come up with better answers and they're not really getting any closer to a better answer to some of these questions some of the problems with young earth creationism. But nonetheless, it's just kind of like rinse and repeat. They're just writing the same things over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, and that's getting kind of stale, right? And so they've moved off of that and broadened the ministry. Whereas Institute for Creation Research is very much focused on the whole creation research angle, right? We are the researchers. We're the ones that are like trying to answer questions, the, the difficult questions in young earth creationism, which is why they're, in a world of hurt in a way, I think, because they, they're they not going to find those answers uh, and they're becoming less and less relevant over time. They've also kind of gone off on their own in terms of differing in the, some of the answers they've, they've uh, come to or resolutions they've come to about flood models compared to other organizations. And Creation Ministries International kind of dabbles in a little of all things, but it's a smaller organization. All right. Anyway, that's my thoughts. That's just the reflections on just I was just looking the other day because I, I wanted to see if there was any creation conferences I could go to over the summer. And it just hit me like how many fewer opportunities there are for people to go and hear a speaker live. Right. An enormous amount of literature and videos and YouTube stuff to watch. But in terms of like interacting with a real person and having an opportunity to maybe ask them questions in person many fewer opportunities than there ever have been. Um, all right, so we're, we're kind of surveying, right, what's happening in the world of young earth creationism. I just show this from Institute for Creation Research to show you ain't nothing happened over there at Institute for Creation Research. Boring. I'm almost to the point where I don't even, uh, I do a daily check typically of some young earth creationist organizations. I'm not on the, they're not on my daily schedule anymore. It's more like, Eh, maybe every three or four days I might type in icr.org and go see what's on the front page there to see if they've published anything interesting. And I don't have to go there every day because they pretty much only publish articles that are published in Acts and Facts, their little newsletter. And so I just look at their latest issue of Acts and Facts and I can see what's coming up for the next two weeks. So I can kind of like get a you know, preview of coming attractions. And they rarely do anything beyond what's in that little newsletter. They're just not as active in generating new content uh, for the web. And it's just really boring content, too. I mean, just to be honest, it's like I look at it and go like, eh, intellectually uninteresting to me. Uh, here's, okay, I went there a couple days ago, and here's their main article. The June 2023 ICR wallpaper. Right, here's a little tiny blurb announcing we have a new wallpaper image that you could use. Uh, that's all you can come up with in terms of something to talk about. They don't even put something new out every, every day sometimes. So they're really stretching it if they have to use up their primary 
you know spot right their number one spot on their website is devoted to introducing the icr wallpaper yeah it's just there's just nothing here in fact i shouldn't have spent this much time on uh, icr so far I, I guess i just wanted to tell you that it's, just, it's hardly worth looking at what about creation uh, ministries international at creation.com now they have uh, they usually have one article a day. Now, about every third day, they might just be a republication of some article from The Vault, right? So I look at it and say, oh, yeah, I remember that from 10 years ago. Uh, it's coming back. This is a new article uh, published in their research journal, The Origin of the Grand Canyon. Now, I'm always interested in the Grand Canyon. I've, I'm an author on a book about uh, the Grand Canyon and old young earth creationism. Uh, and the origins of the Grand Canyon. Uh, I found this image, this uh, image fascinating though, of their like, okay, we're gonna talk about the origins of the Grand Canyon. And uh, you do know that's not the Grand Canyon, right? <laughs> In that picture, <laughs> right? That's Horseshoe Bend, right? Which is near Page, Utah. Now it is the river, the Colorado River, upstream from the Grand Canyon in the canyon that precedes the Grand Canyon. And I think somebody might be able to, might say, well, maybe this is really sort of part of the, in, the initial beginnings of the Grand Canyon, but, but really this is a canyon that then comes out into a valley and then the canyon, the Grand Canyon begins to incise down. I don't know. I mean, the Grand Canyon is so awesome. I know everyone's seen pictures of the Grand Canyon, but if you're going to talk about the Grand Canyon, probably have a picture of the Grand Canyon. Um, Unless they just got confused and thought this was the Grand Canyon. But yeah, what's this article about? It's about young earth creationists uh, not agreeing on how to explain the carving out of the Grand Canyon. Right. And this is I think this is Ord who is uh, drawing up a whole explanation for how the waters running off of the earth after the flood quickly carved the Grand Canyon. And you notice the byline here, and not by the bursting of a later Ice Age dam. Well, that's the other model that other young earth creationists have. In fact, I think the predominant model in young earth creationism is that there was a, um, a large lake, really, in all of northern Utah and part of Colorado. And that massive lake left over from the flood and persisting for several hundred years or maybe even longer after the flood, waters departed. Uh, suddenly had a dam break, right? And water began to run out over this area of southern Utah uh, very, very quickly. And then all that water was used to incise the Grand Canyon at some point later after the flood, right? So here you have, how was the Grand Canyon carved? Well, it was either the water from the flood itself or the water from a lake that was formed after the flood. You might think, well, that's not a big deal. But it is kind of a big deal in the sense that the Grand Canyon is a, an obvious, dramatic geological phenomena for which um, secular geologists or conventional geologists have spent an enormous amount of time investigating and have a, a quite a detailed um, a sketch of the history or the order of events that must have occurred to create the Grand Canyon. And so young earth creationists for a long time, for for 30 years have been trying to come up with an alternative view. There's a book called The Alternative View, which was actually in the Grand Canyon bookstore at one time. Uh, the book that I was part of is actually a response to that particular book and is available in the Grand Canyon bookstore and is available there today still. Um, so a Grand Canyon, it, there, Young Earth Creations have been trying to develop an alternative view or an alternative understanding of the origins of the Grand Canyon. And for 30 years, they still can't come up with even a primary, agreed upon, general description of how the Grand Canyon was formed. Right? Because these are two fairly contrasting views of the origins of the Grand Canyon from a Young Earth Creationist perspective. So that's interesting that Young Earth Creationists can't even can't seem to come to agreement on something that's probably a really central, important topic to find agreement upon. If their flood geology model has any validity, you would think that they would be able to uh, come to some agreement on this since it is such a well-investigated uh, place. 
Ah, uh, was going to talk about this new creation blog post, The Impact of an Asteroid, a really good article uh, about impact craters and how they should be understood within a young Earth, young Earth creationist context. I'll save this for another episode or maybe possibly do a separate video on this. Uh, I'm doing that because I, this is going to run long if I don't uh, skip it right now because I have another topic that I want to spend some time on. Let's move on. Let's move back to Andrews and Genesis. They published an article in the Answers Research Journal, their peer-reviewed journal, uh, in the last couple of weeks. And they highlighted in their, on their webpage there on the top, Genesis flood models, heat deposited by magmatic activity. What do we do with all the heat generated by the flood? That has been a persistent and significant issue for young Earth creationists um, for well over 20 years. Uh, it's called the heat problem. And it is a problem, and it's acknowledged by young Earth creationists that this is one of the significant problems within young Earth creationism is explaining where did the heat go. Now, if you don't know about the heat problem, to sum it up really briefly, if the world was flooded in the space of a few months, and the entire geological column, or the vast majority of the geological column, was laid down in that period of time. That portion of the geological column includes enormous billions of square feet of mag of magmatic rocks, right? Um, so enormous amounts of volcanic activity. The plates are being pushed around and enormous amounts of magma have to come up and fill that space to make more oceanic crust, right, within the space of a year. You have a number of volcanoes. You have a huge amount of ash inside of the, the geological column, right? All of this suggests that there was an enormous amount of heat generated by the activity of volcanic activity and so Answers Research Journal published this article, which is actually part four. There's been three previous parts, and apparently there's going to be at least two more parts in the future. So in at least a six-part series, each of which is a 30, 40-page article, all addressing something called the heat problem associated with really every single flood geology model ever suggested has this problem. In this case, they're discussing the total amount of heat deposited by just magmatic activity, all right? Not friction as well. All right, so what I want to do is I want to take you to the article. I'm just going to read you a couple lines from the abstract. I want to read you a couple lines from the conclusion to give you a sense for the uh, magnitude haha, <laughs> of this problem. Okay, so here we go. From the Answers Research Journal, Heat Problems Associated with Genesis Flood Models by William Warricker, who's also written the other, several other parts of this series. Um, and he is British. I don't know that much more about him. Uh, and he's been trying to solve this heat problem. Many others have come before him, have tried to solve this heat problem uh, to no avail thus far. So how has he done? Let me read you a little bit of this abstract. Uh, I'm trying to get, make sure my head's not in the way here. The highly energetic geological process inevitably accompanying the, ge the Genesis flood must have generated an enormous load, heat load, without raising environmental temperatures beyond biological endurance limits. In other words, couldn't fry the surface of the Earth, okay, uh, and boil off the, er the, the Earth's oceans. That's the kind of heat we're talking about. The amount of heat calculated to be generated by a global flood and the massive movement and release of volcanic material uh, should have boiled the entire ocean off, right? And therefore killed everything in the ocean. In this, the fourth of a series of papers intended to identify and where possible to quantify the key sources of flood heat so we're really just trying to figure out where that heat comes from and how much there is. In other words, how big is this problem? That's actually been part of this series. It's just like quantifying the problem. And what's amazing about the series is every time they go about trying to quantify the problem, the problem just gets bigger. And there's fewer resolutions. There are more problems that are generated. Our primary concern in this paper is with the heat de uh, deposited 
as a result of the flood and post-flood magmatic activity, most of the heat must have been removed from the Earth's surface and biosphere within at, le at most a few hundred years. All right, there's other questions and so forth, but let me just go down here to the main conclusion. Our main conclusion is that the heat deposit in the formation of the ocean floors and that of LIPs is overwhelmingly large and cannot be removed by known natural processes. All right, main conclusion of this paper is the heat is overwhelmingly large and cannot be moved, removed by known natural processes. Nothing we know about how the world functions today, nothing we know about the property, the principles of heat conduction, loss, and so forth, right? The physics of that, nothing we know about physics can help us escape this problem of the overwhelmingly large amount of heat, right? No known process within a biblical compatible time scale. In other words, within several thousand years. If you have millions of years, then yes, of course, you can have this amount of magmatic activity spread over out millions of years, and therefore the heat has been dissipating uh, during that entire time. We have noted, however, that this is only a problem for our limited understanding of the processes at work during the flood. So you now here comes the excuse, right? Um, we don't know exactly what happened during the flood, so maybe there were things that happened, although apparently not known natural processes, some other process that might be natural, but we just don't explain it. We haven't run across, uh, we, we, we have yet to discover or find, or which very probably involves supernatural invention, intervention. In other words, uh, you look, we know a lot about thermal conductivity, right? Thermodynamics is kind of well understood. It's hard to imagine we're going to come up with another fundamental principle about how heat works in this world. And so therefore, during a global flood, we wouldn't expect there to be a whole new process that's natural that would have sucked away the heat. And so we're going to have to appeal, right? We're going to have to appeal to supernatural intervention. God must have removed the heat supernaturally, knowing that this was going to be a problem in some fashion. This is a remarkable, I'll say a remarkable admission from Answers in Genesis. Now, I was going to say, Answers in Genesis published this paper. It doesn't mean they necessarily agree with it. They have a, you know, a... Um, disclaimer on all their articles that doesn't necessarily represent the views of Answers in Genesis. However, Answers in Genesis doesn't have any better answer than this. They've, they've not. The, the folks at Answers in Genesis haven't come up with anything else other than this kind of description. So let me read the conclusions and recommendations at the end, which is just an expansion of what we already read, but I think you'll find it kind of informative. Well, I hope you find it informative. The main conclusion of this article is that the total amount of geological heat deposited in the formation of the ocean floors and that of LIPs is overwhelming. It cannot be removed from the biosphere within the biblically compatible time scale by known natural processes. Essentially, this sentence is saying flood geology, our flood geology models cannot handle this physical observation. We've observed this about the world. We have a model of how the flood could operate. Oh, well, we have, a, we have the Bible which tells us that a flood happened and we can't sync the two together, at least using any known natural process. All right, in other words, we can't explain this. That's what they're saying. Okay, before I forget, I, I just have to mention that uh, Gutsick Gibbon uh, channel, all right, Erica has done a, a fantastic job at looking at the heat problem right and she's gone into the numbers and she's looked at all the young earth creationist materials and she's talked about this multiple times and she has talked about this paper she has a really funny video much more animated than i am uh in which she talks about and goes through this article in a little bit more detail i don't need to uh, do what she did i'm just bringing this article to your attention if you haven't seen that i'll, I'll put a link to to erica's uh last video on this. It's really quite funny. Using CPT style flood models, that's catastrophic plate tectonics, that's one of the names of one of the flood models, 
our theoretical framework, no more than a tiny fraction of the total would have been released into the atmosphere and the oceans during and after the flood. All right, get ready for some crazy numbers, right? Given that the highest bulk ocean temperature in the early Cenozoic did not exceed 13 degrees Celsius, in other words, we can look at the geological column and there's certain ways to estimate the highest temperature rocks, you know, that the, the rock got to uh, in different places. Well, in this case, uh, rocks laid down in ocean water, there's ways to determine what the, uh, the highest ocean temperature could have been, 13 degrees Celsius. In contrast with present day values of around two degrees Celsius. So in other words, ocean heat was much higher in the past, and we can see that from the rock record, and or infer that from the rock record. But it wasn't like hundreds of degrees, right? which is what it would have been if all the heat had dissipated from magmatic activity into the oceans uh, or into the floodwaters. All right, so, um, yeah, Warwicker, which is this previous one of the previous parts of the series, figures that that lower figure of 2 degrees Celsius could be taken as representative pre-flood minimum temperature. So if the pre-flood minimum temperature was, in other words, the oceans were fairly cool before the flood, then they would have some capacity, right, to absorb heat. And so they might have been raised to 13 degrees Celsius. Wow, it sounds like they absorbed a lot of heat, right? Problem solved. Uh, not really. The total heat absorbed by the oceans, Earth's main environmental heat sink, would have been on the order of 6 times 10 to the 25th joules at most. 6 times 10 to the 25th joules. That's an enormous amount of energy, right? Remember, 10 to the 25th means 25 zeros after that 6. But this is only 0.04 or 4 one hundredths of a percent, okay? 4 one hundredths of a percent of the total heat deposition. In other words, the total amount of heat that we've calculated would be generated by a global flood. Only 0.04% of that would be absorbed by the oceans, which is the main heat sink. The remaining 99.96% must have been removed and absorbed elsewhere. It seems that this must have been accomplished by some special, hitherto unrecognized mechanism. Yeah, right? Because you can list a whole bunch of other things where heat could go to, like some heat can be dissipated all the way out into, the, uh, uh, into space. Right? It's going to be absorbed by the atmosphere. Well, first it has to be absorbed by the atmosphere, and the atmosphere can dissipate it into outer space. All right? There's a few other physical phenomena that can help dissipate heat, but uh, none of those can dissipate that 99.96, a significant percentage of that 99.96% of all the heat that's unaccounted for after accounting for how much the oceans can absorb. So this is an enormous problem. That's really the reason I'm spending any time on this at all. I just want to show you this is a huge problem. This isn't just like a little, oh, it's the heat problem. No, it is the enormous heat problem that all flood models face, and they've been facing it for a long time. It's important to appreciate that our inability to identify and acknowledge mechanism for removing the heat excess deposited during and after the flood is an issue first identified over 35 years ago by Baumgartner in 1986, talking about catastrophic plate tectonics, plates moving around, right? This fast plate model that he has. One of the things he realized is that's going to generate an enormous amount of heat. What are we going to do with the heat? I don't know. I'll figure that problem out later. Uh, 35 years later, we still have the heat problem. And young earth creationists have been aware of the heat problem for all of this time. And many young earth creationists have tackled, attempted to tackle that heat problem and been unsuccessful. So going back to another video I just made where I asked the question, does the world appear young? And I was saying that some creationists, like Ken Ham and others, tend to lead their audience to believe that everything around them just points to a young Earth. Like if you just look at the evidence the right way, it points to a young Earth. The amount of heat generated by a global flood doesn't point to a young Earth. <laughs> the amount of magmatic rock in the geological column. If you look at that and ask yourselves, how long would it take to deposit all that volcanic material, the ash and the lava? Right? 
you don't naturally come to oh that would have, that could have just happened over, overnight because you would immediately like if you had any sense about you in terms of thermodynamics you go like wait a second where would all the heat go there's nowhere for that heat to go if it happened in a short amount of time oh i could explain in any, a long period of time though well i'd have plenty of time to dissipate that heat over long periods of time problem solved in other words i naturally look at it as if this is part of an ancient system an ancient history that I'm, that I'm looking at. Uh, it's only a problem in the sense that it represents the limited nature of our human understanding. This is, this is always, you could always explain everything away this way, right? Uh, well, you know, humans are fallible and we don't have all knowledge, so therefore there might be something we're missing and so someday we'll explain it. Again, I go back to 35 years ago, this problem was generated or discovered. And now, well, let's say we know about it before that, but really became apparent with Bob Gunner. And now all of a sudden, 35 years later, we don't have, we're now, young earth creations are no closer to a, a solution to this. Uh, what else did, let, 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 let's just get to the, just one last thing here. Uh, what else was I gonna say here? Uh, let's just hit one other thing here. Although no clear solution to the so-called heat problem associated with the flood and the post-flood magnetism has been identified in this article. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> we're, we're like 35 pages in, I'm sorry, 28 pages in, and we have no clear solution to the heat problem. Um, a number of related geological issues have been noted. Consequently, a number of potential worthwhile lines of future inquiry from a creation science perspective have been identified. And then they go on to, sh to talk about a variety of different types of mechanisms that could remove heat. Although each one of them, it's admitted, none of these today we have understand could remove that amount of heat. But at least there's something more to study, right? So we can continue to write articles about the potential for finding a future solution to this problem. So the heat problem, an enduring issue. I haven't really spoken about the heat. I'm, this might be the first time I've ever talked about the heat issue. And you might be thinking, God, this is such a big issue. Why, why haven't you made a big deal about it? Well, there's plenty of other people that have talked about the heat issue. It is a very significant problem for young earth creationists. And they get a lot of angst when they start talking about it. Uh, and I just, it's not in my wheelhouse in terms of like thermodynamics. So others have talked about it much better than I have. So that's why I'm letting them have it. But I just had to mention it because it showed up as an article on Answers in Genesis recently. Okay, yeah, one, one last item. I said at the end of my This Week in Creationism, I'm trying to find things that are just kind of like a little off the wall, a little different, uh, maybe funny. Now this one's not really funny, but... I'm gonna take it in a different direction than most people might uh, in terms of like all the different things you could go on and talk about uh, with respect to quotes from Trump. Uh, but here we have, I saw this tweet uh, where Trump is defending his comments from the Access Hollywood tape. And if you don't remember the Access Hollywood tape, that's where he said, you can grab them by the, you know, what, and, um, and they, they tend to like it. And he was being asked about that in the Gene Carroll case, right, uh, defamation case. And what's his response to that? Like, what, you know, what did he mean by that? Was it okay to say what he said? And here was his response. Historically, that's true with stars. If you look over the last million years, I guess that's been largely true. Not always, but largely true. Unfortunately or fortunately. Apparently, for him, it's fortunately He's a star because right after he says this, the uh, the person doing the deposition, the lawyer doing the deposition asks Trump, do you think you're a star? And he says, you know, well, yeah, yeah, I'm a star. So he's a star. So, yes, for millions of years, people like him have fortunately been able to get away with making comments like that and actually performing those types of acts. That might be unfortunate, but it's fortunate for him. All right. So. What, what do I say about this? Oh boy, there's so many things that could be said about it, but I'm gonna to stick to one thing that has to do with young earth creationism. Um, I just love the fact he says, and if you look over the last million years, I guess that's been largely true. So apparently Donald Trump believes the world is at least a million years old. Not only is the world a million years old, but he thinks that people have been around for a million years. And for a million years, they've been able to engage in this particular behavior. <laughs> Obviously, he's influenced by evolutionary biology, right? 
because in the world of survival of the fittest and natural selection determining who's a star or not and what they can get away with in olden times and even today people could get away with this type of you know, that's what evolutionary biology has done to the species has made men like him be able to do the things that he does right he's just a product of that process so i had a little fun with this particular uh quote uh, I actually uh, tweeted this out and said that, uh, you know, how long is it going to be before Ken Ham calls out Donald Trump as a compromiser? He's a compromiser. He believes in an old earth, believes in evolutionary biology. When's Ken Ham going to call him out? I mean, Ken Ham calls everybody out who doesn't believe in an old earth, especially other politicians. So I'm waiting. I'm waiting for Ken Ham to attack Donald Trump for saying that over the last million years, all right, instead of saying over the last 6,000 years. Get your act together, Donald Trump. Should be just over the last 6,000 years. This has been true. Okay, that's it. That's it for this week in creationism. Thanks for visiting. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. If you're still watching this video, well, congratulations. You've successfully made it through one of my videos. But seriously, I want to express my gratitude, you know, for you choosing to spend your valuable time with me. Your support really does mean the world to me. I've been creating these videos and it's been a remarkable experience. Not only because I had the opportunity to maybe share some of my knowledge and insights with you, but also because I consider myself a perpetual learner. By making videos, I am learning along the way. And I would say that I am in a relationship with you, the viewer. You know, together we're embarking on this lifelong journey of exploration, right? We're delving into the wonders of the physical universe and beyond. So if you found value in the content that I shared today, I'd really appreciate it if you could show your appreciation by, you know, give me a little like and a follow. Your feedback also and your engagement are really essential to me, and it helps me improve and to grow, as I said. So best wishes to you wherever you might be and whatever you might be doing right now. Take care and God bless. Bye-bye.